From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is David Feldman. Steve Scrovan is out this week, but we are not without the man of the hour, Ralph Nader with whom I spent part of the weekend at the Spring Awakening of the American Museum of Tort Law in Ralph's hometown of Winstead, Connecticut. Beautiful drive to the museum and an amazing museum. How was it for you, Ralph? It was a great event. We had the key people in the, the movie Spotlight, the lawyer, the actual lawyer, not the actor, who brought these lawsuits against the pedophiles. And then we had Jan Schlickman, who was, again, the actual lawyer, in the famous movie as civil action uh, involving toxic contamination of the drinking water in Woburn, Massachusetts. It was a, as you know, it was a big crowd and very intelligent questions. And then they all went to tour the museum. And that's where I saw you uh, absorbing this wonderful narrative of civil justice and the powerful use of of the law of torts, which is the law of wrongful injury, by people who have been wrongfully injured against their perpetrators. And there were the asbestos exhibit, the tobacco exhibit, the Corvair Pinto exhibits, industrial equipment that harmed workers exhibit, and many of the historic cases that built up this common law of torts, which we want to educate people about and students about. The museum website is tortmuseum.org for anybody who wants to visit it. It's open six days a week, except for Tuesdays from 1030 to 5 o'clock. So it's open on weekends in scenic Litchfield County. It's a great museum. It's the second time I've been there, and there, there are new visuals that really make learning tort law for the layman like me simple. I, just very quickly, Ralph, I know we have Ron Unz waiting, but I rented a zip car, And when I arrived, you were talking about adhesion contracts, and I was really motivated to take on corporate America and challenge my contracts with corporations. As I'm driving home, I pull over to get a cup of coffee, and I have a zip car, and suddenly it won't start. And I don't understand it because the battery's working. So I call the 800 number for zip car, and they explain to me that the car won't start because it's late and they shut it down. I'm in the middle of nowhere. And in order for them to restart my zip car, I have to agree to a $50 late fee. This is like two hours after. (laughs) They they turned off your ignition, you mean? (laughs) Yeah, they turned off my ignition. This was like two hours after I was inspired by you to challenge corporate American no longer agree to these adhesion contracts and I'm in the middle of nowhere. And I said, it's a $50 late fee. Otherwise, they won't turn my car back on. And I said, OK, go ahead. <laughs> I said, go ahead. I'll pay the late fee. Isn't so, this amazing? Are you going to challenge the fine print there? They did. In all fairness, they did waive it. But when I got home, uh, I kind of challenged mm-hmm. it. But I was kind of ashamed of myself for just agreeing to it immediately. Anyway, let's get to the program. In the second half of the show, we're going to talk about the difference between needs, wants, and whims, and how that relates to both our consumer culture and our economy. We'll be doing that with Hannah Arbenshow of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. We'll also be checking in, as usual, with Russell Mokhyber, the Mike Hammer of the corporate crime beat. And if time permits, we'll try to get to some more listener questions But first, we're going to talk about whether or not one of the most prestigious colleges in the world, Harvard, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Harvard should be free. Now, if you're a faithful listener to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, you have heard Ralph talk about our first guest, Ron Unz, many times. Mr. Unz has made a conservative argument for raising the minimum wage, a campaign that, to borrow Ralph's phrase, appears now to be unstoppable. Just this week in California, Governor Jerry Brown signed a law to raise the minimum wage to $15 by the year 2022. We're going to talk about that, but also we're going to talk about how Ralph and Mr. Unz, both graduates of Harvard, Ralph from Harvard Law School, have teamed up with three others on a slate to run for the Harvard Board of Overseers. They want Harvard College to eliminate tuition and make their admissions process more transparent transparent 
Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Ron Unz. Great to be here. Welcome, Ron. We're going to have a very interesting discussion here that affects a policy at Harvard that may redound around the world. We're both running for the Board of Overseers. It's relatively powerless, but it's a volunteer post, and we have put out the reason why we're running. And so let's start, Ron, with the reasons why we're running. And the first reason is our belief that Harvard undergraduate tuition, which is, of course, sky high, should be free. Explain to our listeners the case you have made in great detail as to why undergraduates of Harvard should not pay tuition and what effect that would have on other schools and millions of aspiring students who think Harvard is beyond their wallet and they don't even bother applying, even though there are some scholarships and other aids available. Lay the case for why you think Harvard undergraduates should not pay tuition. Well, it's very simple. Harvard does not need the money. Harvard's endowment right now is $38 billion. It's actually become one of the world's largest hedge funds with some little college attached off to one side. And their entire investment income is tax exempt. They don't pay taxes. They're a hedge fund that is exempt from taxes. Their annual investment income is 25 times larger than what they get in tuition from the college students. In other words, if Harvard entirely eliminated undergraduate tuition, it would show virtually no impact on its financial statement every year. Nobody would Ron, even notice. Ron, put some numbers on that. What is the cost of waiving tuition? How many Harvard undergraduates? And how much is the return annually on the average of this $38 billion, listeners, it's with a B here, billion-dollar Harvard University endowment? Sure. The undergraduate tuition, net tuition, in other words, the dollars the university actually gets every year from the uh, from the 64 6500 students is about 140 million dollars a year roughly 140 million a year meanwhile they collect billions of dollars every year in investment income in other words they're invested in other hedge funds in timber in currency swaps in mortgage derivative securities and that's where the university actually makes all of its money while it collects a relatively small amount of money from the students. But even though the dollars are very insignificant to Harvard, they're very significant to the students. And for example, you know, Harvard claims that they provide all these tuition subsidies and financial aid, and that's true in some cases. But for example, if you're a middle-class couple living in New York City, for example, if a husband and wife are both public school teachers in New York City, and if their son or daughter is successful enough to be admitted to Harvard, they would have to basically pay probably the bulk of their life savings to have their son or daughter attend. Probably a couple of hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money to a public school teacher couple in New York City. It's not so, deductible. You know, exactly. It's not deductible. I mean, Harvard does not need the money. And it's absurd that Harvard charges so much. And the whole thing about it, is with Harvard's situation, it's very similar to the situation in a lot of the other elite universities. Stanford, Yale, Princeton, and many other colleges are so wealthy, they really have become hedge funds as well that charge tuition. And if Harvard eliminated tuition because of our victory in the Board of Overseers, I think a lot of those other colleges would as well. And that in turn would put tremendous pressure on the public universities, the public schools, to start cutting their expenses and cutting their tuition. For example, I'm from California, and the University of California system, UCLA, Berkeley, in the mid-1970s, annual tuition was $630 a year. Now it's 15000 And they basically have been pressured by Harvard and Yale and Princeton to provide more and more expensive services to the students and jack up their tuition in return. And that's why, for example, you know, student loans right now, our total student loans are $1.2 trillion. And you have students who are graduating college these days, whether from Harvard or from UCLA or Berkeley, 
that remain in debt servitude for 10 or 20 years, which is just crazy. So we have to cut, we have to dramatically reduce tuition all around the country. And it's very easy for Harvard since they don't even need the money. Before we get into why Harvard is resisting this and who at Harvard is resisting this, tell our listeners what kind of interest rate these student loans are being afflicted by. To be honest, I think it depends on where you borrow the money. In other words, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but for example, you know, if you're borrowing the money from some of the federal loan programs, I think the interest rates aren't that high. But a lot of students are forced to turn to private lenders. And, you know, in effect, in the old days, 20 or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, when somebody graduated college with a degree, they got a good job. They could save up their money and put in a down payment on a home. Nowadays, instead of buying a house, they're paying back their student loans for 10 or 20 years. So it really is ridiculous, and something has to be done about it. And that's actually one of the reasons why there's so much support for Bernie Sanders, because he's promising to support dramatically reducing tuition or even making it free for everybody in America. Well, as you said, you know, years ago, especially after World War II, the tuition was basically zero at the University of California, Berkeley, maybe 50 bucks a year. And it was virtually zero at the City College of New York, the big CUNY system. And, of course, for decades, uh, there hasn't been tuition for students in Germany, Italy, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, France, uh, until recently, England has gone overboard with more tuition now because they're so mismanaged. Uh, So it isn't like it doesn't have precedent. And I think Bernie Sanders' point is you go to high school you know, without paying tuition, you should go to college without paying tuition. President Obama now has uh, supporting tuition-free community colleges. There are 1,200 of them in the country. So the trend is in that direction. But why is Harvard resisting? I mean, have you you've been in contact with people uh, in the administration at Harvard? Why are they resisting so much? It really makes no sense. I mean, it's not like, for example they need the money or that, I mean, we're talking, if Harvard reallocated 4% of their annual investment earnings, they could abolish college tuition, 4%. They could keep the other 96% and use it to grow their endowment the way it's been growing. I honestly think the reason is more sort of the stodginess of a very conservative, cautious institution. In other words, for example, you know, just a week or two ago, Five former presidents of the Harvard Board of Overseers, the board we're running for, came out with a letter saying it would be fiscally irresponsible for Harvard to abolish tuition. Now, we're talking about 4% of their earnings every year. It's not 4% of their endowment. It's 4% of the money they make every year on their endowment. When you look at Harvard, for example, most universities around the country have their finals before Christmas vacation rather than after Christmas vacation because, you know, if you have your finals after Christmas, everybody's busy studying and worrying over the Christmas holiday. It took Harvard 58 years to move their finals to before Christmas from after Christmas. <laughs> and so, you know, with something like that, I mean, the notion of abolishing Christian is just shocking to them. On the other hand, if we win our battle and get on the board of overseers, Just as you said, the Board of Overseers doesn't have legal power, but it would be a referendum of the entire 300,000 Harvard alumni community. And if we win that referendum, I feel very confident Harvard will abolish tuition. And if Harvard abolishes tuition, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and lots of other wealthy colleges will immediately follow. And then what would the effect on the public colleges and universities who aren't as rich as Harvard or Yale, if this happens at Harvard, what would be the effect on their tuition and their bloated administrative costs? It it would put tremendous pressure on them to start competing on the basis of price and cost rather than luxuries. I mean, the truth is, UCLA and Berkeley, if you go back 30 or 40 years ago, you know, the cafeteria food wasn't as nice The dormitories weren't as fancy. They didn't have Olympic swimming pools. They didn't have as large a staff 
but tuition was six hundred dollars a year, and now it's fifteen thousand. I think most students would prefer having food that wasn't as nice and old-fashioned dormitories, and not being in debt servitude for the next ten or twenty years after they and, graduate. And also, the percentage of the university budgets that go to administrators and how exactly. high, highly paid administrators are paid much more than the tenured faculty who, who've been there for 40, 50 years, not to mention the sports coaches, the football exactly. and basketball. In some universities, it's over 30%, just administration. Oh. And, you know, they add another one and they add a clerk <laughs> to help them and it just spirals. And do they know how to keep their jobs? They'll lay off anything. They'll close departmental libraries at universities before they will lay off some of the bloated administrative burdens that they have. That's exactly right. There was a great article in The Nation back a few months ago pointing out that even though university costs have risen so dramatically and so many students and their families have to go into debt or put in so much money, you still have a situation where there are fewer and fewer faculty members who have tenure, who have reasonable salaries. There have all these adjunct faculty members who are teaching the classes and being paid almost nothing. So the article in The Nation asked if the professors, if the people who teach the classes are being paid less and less, why are the costs more and more? And the answer is it's all being eaten up by these administrators. 20 or 30 years ago, there was one administrator for every two faculty members. Now it's doubled, and there's one administrator for one faculty member. Pretty soon down the road, all of the permanent employees at these universities will be administrators, and all the classes will be taught by adjuncts who are paid almost nothing, who are collecting food stamps because their salaries are so low. And what listeners, you know, to- Ron is not exaggerating here at all. I know adjunct professors, for example, teaching in the Albany, New York area, who make $3,000 for an entire semester course. And over half of all teachers at universities in the United States, public universities, are adjuncts. Hundreds of thousands of them, they don't make what is equivalent to the minimum wage. And that's why some of them are trying to organize a a nationwide union. So it is really embarrassing to, to the academic world that such a lack of intelligence is streaming through these universities, developing bureaucracies and overlapping fiefdoms at the expense of the teachers and the students and the academic facilities, in contrast to the sports and entertainment facilities. The allocation there is not prudent. Now, tell our listeners, this is really self-interest with us, Ron, who votes for the Board of Overseers slate? at Harvard, and when does the voting start? Who's qualified to vote? How many are there in terms of alumni? And when's the voting start? Okay, anybody who has a Harvard degree, a college degree, a law school degree, a med school degree, is eligible to vote, and they all receive their ballots in the mail. The ballots, I think, were probably mailed out right at the end of last week, so they should be arriving in people's mailboxes probably this week or at the latest, right at the beginning of next week. Every alumnus has the right to vote for up to five candidates. There are five of us running. We're grouped as the Free Harvard, Fair Harvard slate, and if we get the support of people, we'll be on the Board of Overseers. And the results of that referendum, I think, will persuade Harvard to give up 4% of their hedge fund earnings every year and abolish tuition for all the undergraduates. The total number of people eligible to vote, Harvard alumni, is about 300,000 or 320,000. So it's a very large number of people, many of them here in California, probably listening to this radio show. And if all of them can help get the word out, then I think we'll win and Harvard will start a trend across the United States for the rich universities to abolish tuition and for the state colleges and universities to dramatically cut their costs and cut their tuition. Yes, we've done the free Harvard part of our slate. Well, what's our website? How do people get to know what we're standing for? Okay, the other half of what we're running on is that there's a lot of evidence that the Harvard admission system has become very corrupt in the last 10 or 20 years. I mean, we're talking about all sorts of different types of corruption. You know, 
there's a lot of evidence that there's racial discrimination against Asian applicants. In other words, just like 60 or 70 years ago, there was a lot of evidence of a Jewish quota at Harvard, where basically Harvard admitted only a certain number of Jewish students every year. There's a lot of evidence that there's an Asian quota at Harvard. For example, the per capita enrollment of Asian American students at Harvard has dropped by about 60% over the last 20 years, 25 years. In other words, the Asian population has doubled. Asians do very well in school. They work hard. They have good test scores. But the number of Asian students at Harvard is lower today than it was 25 years ago, which is very suspicious. But it's not just that type of corruption. There's a tremendous amount of financial corruption. There's evidence that Wealthy families can, in effect, pay bribes to Harvard to get their sons or daughters admitted. Back about 10 years ago, there was a great book that came out by a Wall Street Journal reporter named Daniel Golden called The Price of Admissions. He ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for his articles, and it was filled with all these stories of the corrupt admissions practices at Harvard, at Yale, at Princeton, at all of these other schools where you have basically people bribing their way into those schools. And, you know, the most shocking case, because of court records, he was able to find, for example, that a very wealthy family, a billionaire family, paid millions of dollars in bribes, really, call it plainly, it really was bribes, to Harvard to get their undeserving son admitted to the Harvard admissions. And, you know, when we're talking about it, I mean, the funny thing about it is, the person who was admitted, you know, that case that came out because of the court records, it's Donald Trump's son-in-law. Do we really want a system where Donald Trump's son-in-law, who comes from a family of billionaires, can get admitted to Harvard because they pay millions of dollars in bribes? What we're talking about in our platform is that Harvard should be more transparent in their admissions process. They should provide more information as to why they pick certain students and not other students. And the students who get admitted to Harvard really have the inside track on the future of their career. They can easily get into the top law schools. They can easily get into the top law firms eventually. They can get top jobs on Wall Street. And if we have a national elite selected in a corrupt manner, we'll end up with a corrupt national elite. And that's exactly what's happened the last 10 or 20 years with all of these financial scandals and other corruption taking place in our society. Well, Ron Unz, listeners should know, I was trained as a theoretical physicist, not a lawyer. So, Ron, when you use the word bribes, I want to clarify this. This isn't personal payoffs to officials at Harvard. It's basically donations to Harvard's endowment or scholarships or building projects so technically, they're not bribes, uh, which would result in indictments to get into Harvard. And, you know, I graduated from Princeton, you graduated from Harvard undergrad. And we know that very rich families, it's very desirable for the admissions people at those universities to bring in to their classes the children of very rich families, because down the road, if not immediately, they think they're going to be major contributors to the perpetuation and enlargement of the university. Maybe their names will be on dormitory buildings or library buildings like Firestone Library at Princeton. So that's who you mean, right, when you talk about that? That's where there's hard evidence. In other words, again, you know, in those cases, the court records have shown that very large sums of money were given to Harvard. At the same time, a son or daughter from that family who clearly was unqualified was admitted. But to be perfectly honest, Ralph, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that actual bribes are sometimes paid to university officials. In other words, secret private payments made to officials in the admissions office or the administration to get their sons or daughters admitted. In other words, the money not going to the university, but basically going to the private bank accounts of certain officials. Now, it's not proven, but for example, in the book, The Price of Admission by Daniel Golden, he interviewed all these admissions officials, and they said that they're constantly being offered personal bribes by wealthy families to get admitted. And when you look at some of the things going on, some of the very suspicious admissions decisions being made and, you know, 
sometimes, for example, in another book by Jacques Steinberg, who is the chief higher education reporter at the New York Times and sat in on the admissions process, he was saying, you know, these admissions officers sit around when they're making their decisions. And sometimes when one of them is pressing for the admission of a clearly underqualified applicant, the other admissions officers say, basically say, how much money is his family paying you to get that son admitted? I mean, so, you know, the trouble is when you have a very opaque process where families are willing to pay tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their children admitted to an elite school, and where the admissions officers are very poorly paid, most of them earn less than public school teachers, you really have a very dangerous process that's open to financial malfeasance. So, you know, I, I think there's certainly a lot of quote bribery going on where families pay millions of dollars in donations to the university, but I think there's actually quite a lot of honest-to-goodness, old-fashioned, illegal bribery going on as well. Yeah. To, oh, sure. to elaborate, Ron, we're talking to Ron Unz, who is running for the Board of Overseers at Harvard University, along with yours truly. You know, overseas, in other countries, I don't want to be ethnocentric about it, but there is a habitual practice by very rich people whose children aren't really up to the academic standards of the university where they actually will tender offers of money, wine, dine, personally to officials of universities. And when they want to get their children into Ivy League schools like Harvard, they don't change their cultural appeal that is more accepted in some of these countries. For example, the major university in Mexico has had a history of rich people being able to get their children in who aren't as academically qualified as middle or lower income students who don't have those kinds of checkbooks. But when you talk about admissions, and we're going to have to go to the minimum wage issue in a minute, are you measuring the criteria for admissions? Those complex forms of fraud that I call standardized multiple choice tests? I mean, is that your criteria for quotas and prejudice, or is it on a broader basis that you're talking about? Well, I mean, it really includes everything. For example, look, I, I mean, it's the sort of thing where I've talked with all these individual people involved in the admissions process, and I've read these books. You know, I mean, Daniel Golden's book, he interviewed, for example, in the case of that, um, you know, Trump's son-in-law who was admitted to Harvard, he basically interviewed all the people at that boys' school, and they said they were astonished he was admitted to Harvard because he just wasn't qualified. He yeah. just wasn't smart enough. He wasn't hardworking enough. There right. were all these other students in the school who were so much better in every way, standardized test scores, grade point average, everything, that they just couldn't believe he was admitted to Harvard. And so, you know, the fact that that happened right at the same time that his billionaire father gave $2 million or $3 million to Harvard seems awfully suspicious. Yes, and you know, there are other criteria, too. For example, you're more likely to get in if you're an athlete into the Ivy League, even though the Ivy League says we do not give athletic scholarships like Ohio State and University of Texas and so forth. Yeah, they don't give athletic scholarships, but if you are a great football player, you can get into Harvard or for instance, say with a B average, where somebody with an A minus average who doesn't play football uh, couldn't get in. That's one abuse, and they ought to be more uh, disclosive of that. They're very secretive about that. Another preference for admission is one that's been going on for over 100 years. They're called legacy admissions. That is, if your papa or grandfather or grandmother or mother got into Princeton, you have a leg up to get in because they just figure there'll be more loyal alumni and they'll give more money. And so that's another non-meritorious criteria in terms of academic potential and achievement. The third one is the one I'm really upset about, and that is you can get a low-income student, say from Harlem, who is very diligent, but, you know, lives in an environment where they don't exactly have an academic aura about where they're living. Sirens, tenements, rats, uh, running around, poverty. But this student, let's say, is a really active student in the neighborhood. The student helps with food kitchens. The student helps younger students, uh, tutoring them. That doesn't even count, Ron. That doesn't count in terms of 
points to get into these schools, civic activity in a neighborhood, which is extremely demanding on all kinds of talents of young people. It's not easy. It takes uh, the intangible talents of a personality and character, and they don't even consider that. So I think what we're trying to do as volunteers on the Board of Overseers, should we get elected in the coming weeks, is to open up all these questions. It really is disquieting and dismaying that people at these top universities who aspire to the mind of intellectual honesty and options for revision of what their policies are, are stonewalling year after year, decade after decade. So in a self-seeking appeal, Ron, anybody listening who's a Harvard graduate, undergraduate, or any of the graduate schools, consider voting for us when you get the package in the mail from Harvard University. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Since 1988, I don't believe we've had a president who didn't graduate from either Yale or Harvard. I don't think we've had a Supreme Court justice who didn't come to us from either Yale Law School or Harvard Law School. What about breaking up Harvard and Yale? Wouldn't the Justice Department be serving the American people better by breaking up these elite universities? I think it would be impossible to find an attorney general who didn't go to Harvard or Yale, so they wouldn't be inclined to do that. But what about breaking these schools up? Well, they're nonprofits, so it doesn't come under the antitrust laws uh, in terms of market share or anything like that. But the way to break up their dominance and get more people from around the country, for example, being considered for nomination to the Supreme Court of the United States or to cabinet posts is to do what Ron has been recommending. Because I think, Ron, what you're looking for is a democratization of an open admission process, correct? Exactly, exactly. Again, the point is, you know, there's nothing wrong with the majority of our sort of top people coming from some of these elite universities, so long as the people who go into the elite universities are selected in a better manner. In other words, when you have a pipeline like that, and where you have such a large fraction of the students being admitted or even applying to Harvard and these other schools, coming from a very narrow slice of our society, it produces a very unhealthy atmosphere. And in fact, the point that Ralph made about athletic admissions really shocked me. In other words, I hadn't really focused on that as much until a few weeks ago, but I found out from talking with a few people that a remarkable fraction of the undergrads admitted to Harvard get in because they come from some of these sort of affluent elite private schools that have all these obscure sports like lacrosse or something like that. Because, you know, basically, you know, you have 15 or 20 percent of the Harvard admissions apparently going to athletic preferences. And with all these different sports, you basically can get in if you are specializing in a sport where nobody who goes to a public school is involved in. But, you know, some people go to a Greenwich school. I mean, about 15 years ago, I checked that 40% of the Princeton undergraduates were playing varsity sports. And, of course, it's not just football, baseball, basketball. They have, as you indicated, an amazing variety of sports like squash. Of course, they have tennis. They have a whole variety that are only played in any systemic way at these private prep schools for the most part. But anyway... We're almost running out of time, Ron. I want to give you an opportunity as the person who led the way for conservative support for increasing minimum wage in this country, because, uh, as you say, it would reduce the amount laid out for food stamps and housing assistance, energy assistance, Medicaid, if people earned a more living wage. Tell us what Jerry Brown and the legislature just did and what Jerry Brown said after he signed the bill. Well, we won a tremendous victory just in the last week or so, when California became the first state in America to have a statewide minimum wage of $15 an hour. I mean, Ralph, you remember, it was just a couple of years ago that you and I and John Richard were having dinner in D.C. and things looked hopeless. In other words, Congress was stalled on the issue. They'd given up on it. President Obama was still proposing a $9 minimum wage, which is ridiculously low. It looked hopeless. 
But we all put our noses to the grindstone, and it looks like we're on the verge of a national victory, at least for you know, 10 or $12 an hour minimum wage, with California going for $15. By when? The only... Oh, by, by 2022, I think. So it'll take right. a while for a phase in, but you know, $15 is a very high level. The one fly in the ointment was at the same time that Jerry Brown signed that historic bill raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour in California. He also publicly declared <laughs> that there was no economic justification for a higher minimum wage. And that, in effect, he was saying basically that he thought from an economic point of view, it was a stupid idea, that it was an ignorant idea, but he supported it because it was popular. Now, you know, I agree that it's very popular, but I think there's a very strong economic case for a higher minimum wage, which you and I and so many other people have been making. And I really would hope that Jerry Brown started reading some of our articles so that he could defend the logic of what he was supporting. And it's great that he signed the bill, but it would be nice if he sort of understood the issue as well. And tell people who want to get in touch with you how they can do so, Ron Unz. Sure. I'm right now running for the U.S. Senate in California as a Republican with raising the federal minimum wage being one of my major issues. And anybody who wants to look at where I stand on these issues can go to my website, which is uns2016.org, Ron Unz running for the U.S. Senate in California. And the truth is, California is a very heavily Democratic state, so it's an uphill battle for any Republican to win. And I'm not saying necessarily I will, but I think it's a very healthy thing for a Republican running in California to be a strong advocate of raising the federal minimum wage and certainly raising it here in California. And I'm going to be doing my best with the primary coming up. Thank you. We've been speaking with Ron Unz. It's spelled U-N-Z, if you've been wondering. U-N-Z, Ron Unz, who is running with me for the Harvard Board of Overseers, a volunteer position, but one where we can raise some very, very important questions about admissions, tuition, and other matters that advance the educational interest in this country. And, you know, if you do it at Harvard, as Ron has pointed out, it spreads very rapidly throughout the country because Harvard's seen as a standard bearer. Thank you very much, Ron Enns. Great to be here. We've been speaking with Ron Unz. For more, go to freeharvard.org for more on all of that. And we will link to all of the relevant websites and articles on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. Now let's take a moment and see what corporate crime reporter Russell Mokhyber has hot off the wire for us. Russell? From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute. For Tuesday, April 5, 2016, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Senator Chris Murphy has launched a tweet attack against Democratic presidential candidate Senator Bernie Sanders. Murphy has endorsed Sanders' rival, Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton, for president. In five tweets, Murphy went after Sanders for again repeating that he doesn't support gun manufacturer liability in the case brought by the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre against the makers of the AR-15 assault rifle that killed 26 people, including 20 children. Do I think the victims of a crime with a gun should be able to sue the manufacturer? Sanders said to the Daily News, No, I don't. Bernie is a friend, but this is really bad, Murphy tweets. Dems can't nominate a candidate who supports gun manufacturer immunity. From the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Now let's turn to our next topic, needs, wants, and whims. Ralph, why don't you do the honors and introduce our next guest, Hannah Archambault. Thank you. Hannah Archambault is a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts Department of Economics, which is known for its progressive curriculum and teachers. And last summer, Hannah worked with us on what I think is one of the most important economic questions of our times, which is, why is it that regular growth of the economy seems to be in a disconnect with the well-being of a majority of the people? So the GDP keeps growing. But somehow, even though it's over 20 times greater per capita adjusted for inflation than it was in 1900, there's still a lot of poor people, a lot of low-income people, a lot of people deep in debt. So, Hannah, welcome to a series of questions on this. In your research, 
What did you decide to parse here? Such a vast area. And we talked about the part of the economy that goes to needs, necessities like housing and food and health care and transportation. Then the part of the economy that goes to wants like tourism. And, and then the part of the economy that we called whims. And if anybody wants to know what a whim is, today's Wall Street Journal, you'll like this, Hannah. There's an article that says, apps aim to keep devices from disrupting sleep. And what it is, is as more, I'm quoting, as more people head to bed with smartphones or tablets, there's increasing focus on the so-called blue light the devices emit. And that, that may cause a decrease in the hormone melatonin, which makes people feel sleepy. So some companies come up with an app to shift the light emitted by the screens of your iPad or or iPhone to oranges and reds at night. That might be considered a whim. But anyway, do you want to talk about what you found in your research? Yeah. Well, the first thing that I did was try to kind of think about a definition of what needs, wants, and whims would be. Because without that, we can't really think about the material conditions of people at all, which is clearly what we're interested in. And because needs are by a long shot, the sort of best theorized from many, many different schools of thoughts, particularly economists, ethicists, philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists, essentially all the social sciences have sort of weighed in to what we mean by needs. And there's sort of this complication with needs where, you know, as a heterodox economist, I don't want to fall into this trap of talking about what's called revealed preferences, which is basically the idea that whatever someone accesses is what they needed at that moment. So I want to avoid that. But at the same time, I'm a social scientist and I recognize that needs are essentially socially embedded because people are. So everything we do is sort of in relation to the people around us and our culture and society. And so I, I had to sort of parse through this idea and I came across some pretty interesting ways of thinking about it. And first of all is that this avoiding the, the mainstream trap, but also simultaneously avoiding the, the sort of like really relativist ideas where you, you can't talk about material needs at all. And the, the people that I found the most useful were generally coming from the ethicist side. In particular, I was really interested in these two philosophers and ethicists Len Doyle and Ian Guff, who had sort of a, a Rawlsian perspective where they talked about something called an optimorum, which they defined as the minimum amount of what they called intermediate need satisfaction, which is a culturally and historically defined way to satisfy basic needs that have characteristics that are cross-cultural, like calories or shelter from the elements while also still reflecting a, a specific way of life. And this kind of idea of talking about it in this way allows us to reject that, you know, sort of mainstream neoclassical sort of utility maximization where we, we don't actually have anything we can measure while still acknowledging that needs are, are socially constructed to an extent. And, you know, I, I tried to think through some ways that we could operationalize this. We could actually think about measuring it. And the main way that, I, the, one of the interesting ways that I, I started to think about it was actually not thinking about it as a basket of goods, but rather as measuring it in terms of the amount of something you have in order to put it sort of in a, you know, Adam Smith had this idea of a, a way of living, satisfying a way of living, and that's what needs were. So, we can think of, you know, not, not even so much as like, do you have a cell phone or do you not have a cell phone, but do you have adequate access to the kind of cell phone that allows you to participate in your way of life? So allows you to find a job and interact with your community and so on and so forth. And the one way I thought of, of maybe measuring it is in terms of decile, as when we're thinking about consumption specifically. So in terms of like housing, you know, someone in the anywhere between the fourth and the, let's say, sixth housing or sixth decile would all be adequately satisfying their needs. And then above that, we could maybe talk about someone satisfying wants. And then in the top two deciles or something would be people satisfying whims. So... I thought that this was the most useful way of really thinking about it, more of thinking about 
if these levels of specific needs that are culturally constructed are being met, less so than trying to put together a basket of goods, because putting together a basket of goods is always really difficult. I mean, that's why our measurements of poverty are so inadequate, is because we try to do it based on a, a basket of goods, and baskets of goods are constantly changing. Hannah, a listeners should know that you're talking about yardsticks of measuring economic progress. And if, let's say, the corporations yeah. control the yardsticks, then mm-hmm. we, we measure progress by their definition, not by what we all are beginning to realize that the more the economy grows, the more people are left behind. And we have half yeah. of the people in this country essentially in yeah. a poor category. So it's a matter of who controls the yardstick. And when I spoke yeah. to you last summer, I gave the example of a chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, would go to the Senate on an annual State of the Economy testimony before the Joint Economic Commission. And he would say, well, the economy's good, profits are up, sales are up, inventories are at a healthy level, uh, jobs are steady. But he would never say something like, child poverty is increasing. He would never say something like there's widespread incidence of hunger in the country or Mm -hmm. inadequate housing. He was using corporate yardsticks and whoever controls the yardsticks controls the agenda. It controls what politicians talk about, what Congress deals with. And do you see economists around the country starting more and more to focus on the quality of an economy, not just its, uh, as you say, cumulative quantity of output. Yeah. Uh, are they yeah. doing that? Um, I, I think that since the, the most recent crisis and recession, there's definitely been a turn towards the kind of political economy that we do at UMass Amherst. So certainly heterodox economists have always been doing this. We've always been talking about, and like when I'm talking about the, the measurements, I'm talking about comparing different levels. So sort of immediately getting into talking about inequality. And I definitely think that there's more of a focus on that. I mean, you you know, Piketty wrote his book and there, the New York Times talks about inequality now. So I do think that there is a shift to thinking about these different things. I mean, one really interesting thing that I think people are really starting to talk about in this is healthcare and the fact that we're spending more on healthcare than we ever have in the United States more than anyone else in the world, but we still have really terrible health outcomes. So I think that that, for example, is one place where people are really starting to see this difference between the amount you spend and the quality of what you're doing. I think that's certainly true, and we can never ignore the qualitative aspects. Uh, and they need yeah. to, I think these things need to come hand in hand. We need to talk about the levels and the amount and the difference between the amount, and we need to think about the content of consumption as well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, John Rowe, who helped write an article for the Atlantic magazine years ago called Redefining Progress, gave the example that if parents are playing with their children with wooden blocks inherited by their parents, they're not adding to the GDP. But if a parent goes out and buys an $80 Nintendo game, which children tire of more quickly and don't involve parental child interaction, that's increasing the GMP. The more crime there is, the more investigators, detectives, the more repair, property damage increases the GDP. So a lot of bad things increase economic growth. But one of my favorites is phony bumpers on cars. So if you have a five mile an hour collision, you got a $2,000 repair job, which increases sales, jobs, and profits by the repair industry. That increases the GDP, but you know, yeah. we'd rather do without it and have a functional yeah. bumper. So this is a very revolutionary reevaluation of economic activity, and it's very important that that begin to spread among economists and students in departments of yeah. economics. And do you see the textbooks? Do you see outside of the University of Massachusetts, do you see this? I mean, I studied uh, Economics 101 at Princeton, and they, it was all supply-demand curves. It was all quantitative. Mm-hmm. We, we never even mentioned the word consumer, by the way. So you see a change in the textbooks, a change in the curriculum? Honestly, on the outside of the heterodox schools, having I've spoken to lots of other friends who teach at other universities, not really. The Most textbooks are still the standard you know, Macro 101 textbooks are still talking about the same batch of lies <laughs> that they have been for, yeah. for the last 60 years. It's, it's almost and like an I, ideology. It's an ideology yeah. of, of, of control. It doesn't bring in reality. It excludes yeah. a lot of reality. 
Yeah. On the bright side, many of my friends, my colleagues from UMass Amherst and from other heterodox schools are getting hired right out of university. There's been, you know, there's a real crisis in higher education of finding a job, essentially, when once you finish your graduate degree. But so many of my friends have been hired straight out, which and are actually teaching undergrads and are teaching undergrads with the tools that we learned and with the kind of economics that we learned. So I think that there is potential, even if it hasn't, if it isn't reaching into the mainstream universities right now and reaching the the vast majority of undergrads, I think the most recent crisis and this sort of ongoing discussion about inequality is changing the conversation and, and hopefully it will reach the, the, the mainstream intro-university campuses, classes yeah. in the near future. And your professor, Robert Poland, he has spearheaded a reevaluation of the energy part of our economy with mm-hmm. his writings on the green economy, which is really another yeah. way of substituting solar energy, energy efficiency, wind power for fossil fuels and nuclear. And in doing so, increasing the healthy environment, reducing all kinds of geopolitical complications abroad, and increasing jobs. And he's put mm-hmm. forth this very elaborate green economy. So, you see, it comes down to people's everyday lives. It's not just something yeah. theoretical. It's not, yeah. not something a bunch of equations. And do you think you're going to persist in this kind of work as you get your Ph.D. and go out into the world where you're going to apply your economic knowledge? Yeah, Absolutely. I personally am really interested in inequality and inequality, economic inequality based on labor and also economic inequality based on race and gender and sexuality, et cetera. And and that's definitely what I want to be doing. You know, I, I teach undergrads myself. I actually teach with Bob. And, you know, the main thing that I always try to make sure my students understand is that economics is a not value free and b and because of and as a result and as a reason it's because it's a social science we're talking about people we're talking about my students and their families and the the real material lives that that they lead and to me this is the most important thing to impart upon my own students and it is something that i think most americans could benefit from thinking about thinking about when you you say you're not interested in economics or you think you're not interested in the way the economy is functioning, that you're really talking about your own well-being. The economy is what we make it. It's our interactions with each other, both in and outside of markets. All of these are part of the economy. So I certainly hope that I can continue to work on this myself, learn more about it myself, and help other people understand that knowing about the economy is integral to their well-being. And you know a bit about public budgets. You worked in the New York City budget office after you graduated mm-hmm. from college. And I think people have got to realize that this notion of progress is a very manipulative definition by the powers that be, and that our economy has grown enormously since 1950, and there's never been more inequality in yeah. terms of wealth and income between yeah. the mass of the people and the few at the top. So. Let's hope you continue to be a a conservative revolutionary, because this is very (laughs) conservative. The corporations are the radicals (laughs) subverting our democratic pretensions in so many ways. So thank you very much. We've been talking with Hannah Archambault, who is a graduate student and also an instructor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. How would they reach you if they wanted to get in contact with you, Hannah? They can send me an email at H Archambo. That's A R C H A M as in Mary, B as in boy, A U L T as in Tom at umass.edu. Very good. Thank you very much, Hannah, and to be continued. Thanks so much, Ralph. Yep. Okay. Have a good Bye-bye day. Now. I remember Bobby Kennedy said the GNP measures everything but what makes life worth living. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Unfortunately, the rest of the Congress didn't pick up on that. <laughs> This comes from one of our listeners, Joanne Hall. She says, Ralph, should the U.S. have an industrial policy similar to China, Japan, Germany, and South Korea? Well, it does have an industrial policy. It's called Wall Street's control over Washington. That is, the large corporations and their lobbyists have had enormous influence in what public budgets pay attention to, that the taxpayer funds. And so there's huge subsidies, for example, for the industries that we now read about, the 
semiconductor, computer industry, pharmaceutical industry, the biotech industry, the and nanotech industry is almost completely taxpayer supported and the original research and development, the containerization industry. So some of it is good. Some of it is not just driven by corporate profiteering. And all of it is really not creating many jobs. So you have Google, which is a giant worldwide company, and it has fewer jobs than Kodak Company had 30 years ago in Rochester, New York. And I'm told that Facebook, which almost everybody in the world now knows, has fewer than 20,000 employees, which used to be a fair size auto plant in the 1940s. So we do have an industrial policy. It's reflected in the corporate tax code and the twisted, grotesque ways that corporations get rewarded with lower taxes for doing the wrong things and like parking their profits overseas in tax havens or islands like the Grand Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. So, But we don't have a coherent industrial policy that reflects the interests of the mass of the people. The way I think Germany and Japan pursued, not that they don't have their own corporate elites, but South Korea, for example, had an industrial policy, and look at the comparisons. In 1953, their per capita GDP of South Korea was equal to the Congo in Africa, a very poor country, 1953, still in the end of the Korean War. And now South Korea is one of the top 10 most powerful economies in the world. And the standard of living, of course, is much, much higher than it is in in the Congo. So just to talk about industrial policy is to raise the hackles of right-wingers in Congress. Oh, that's socialism. But you see, we have an industrial policy by default succumbing to the shaping of our economy through government policies, subsidies, taxes, government contracts, military contracts, etc., by default. And so we should have a discussion nationally that if we're going to have all these powerful levers coming out of Washington to shape the economy, let's have it do it in a very just manner instead of blowing up more of the world and piling up massive overkill weapons of mass destruction. Well, that's our show. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming either on Ralph's Facebook page or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. Steve Scrovan will be back with us next week. I want to thank our guest today, Ron Unz, who, along with Ralph, is running for the Harvard Board of Overseers to eliminate tuition at Harvard. And also thanks to Hannah Arbuchot for her paper on needs, wants, and whims. All of the links for our guests will be posted on the RalphNaderRadioHour.com, along with a transcript of this episode. You'll have to give us a few days to get the transcript up there. For Ralph's weekly blog, go to Nader.org. For more of Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimereporter.com. Remember to visit the country's only law museum, the American Museum of Tort Law in Winstead, Connecticut. Go to TortMuseum.org. Join us next week. Talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you very much, David. Thank the audience. And once again, my exhortation to all people listening, become more active as citizens. That's the fundamental basis for the quality of life and justice in America.